Arguing and debating with a person in authority rarely goes well. But unfortunately, we see this with so-called Christians that debate with Jesus about they are his followers. Come join us for a discussion about depart, the scariest word in the Bible on the way. Welcome to The Way with Leslie King and Scott Grimmett. See the ocean, how it sways in the sun. Relationships are a really funny thing. Now, I can remember just starting high school, ninth grader, and it's important when you're in high school to be accepted to kind of be with, in with the in crowds, yeah. uh, have the right relationships and yeah, things like mean. that. Uh, yeah, nothing but awkward and challenging. Uh, but it was almost impossible as a freshman or even a sophomore to be in the in crowd, if you will. And, and I remember um, as a ninth and 10th grader uh, being in sports and being able to be around senior classmen, juniors and seniors, and being able to kind of have um, kind of a pleasant relationship with him because I was in the sport, right? right. And so um, I've seen this with others, and I kind of saw some of this awkwardness in some of my relationships. And, you know, outside of practice, you know, you're coming down the hallway, and you see that senior who's the captain, and you come up, and you go, hi, and you're trying to mix and mingle with them, and you get completely ignored, <laughs> right? So you make the false mistake here, an embarrassing mistake of thinking you're in relationship with them, and you're really not. And really because not. of a casual connection, or maybe because you wear the same kind of clothes, or you know you're attending church, or you're or you're doing something that makes it look like you're in the in crowd, it doesn't mean necessarily you're in an intimate relationship with those individuals. Right. And I can just remember being completely ignored, thinking as a younger classman that because somebody was nice to me in one setting, or I had you know, some politeness and some a little bit of acceptance that I was actually in relationship with them to the point to where I was in the in crowd. They knew me. I knew them. That was really not the case at all. And I think that this is kind of related, but not related to this idea of having relationships like we're going to talk about today. Because we have a top topic today called depart. And it's really not as much about the departure but it's about realizing the relationship connection and where you're at with your soul, with your relationship with God, and things of that nature. So our topic today is depart, I never knew you. Oh, yeah. And so the I never knew you is about we don't have a relationship that's right. kind of thing. I might have been nice to you on some occasions because that's my character, senior classman, right. or in this case, Jesus, but it doesn't mean necessarily you and I have an ongoing intimate relationship because you're not really connected to me That's right. kind of thing. The, the sad part about that scenario is that in the case where the senior captain, you know, he was being a bit of a jerk to you but by, yeah, yeah. by doing that, yeah. whereas Jesus doesn't treat anybody like that. No. It, and the, the fault for any of the part from me is going to be completely on us. On each one of us. And yeah. it's a deeply intimate, deeply personal thing. Right. So, And we're going to go through and we're going to look at the scriptures here. There are several of them. And it starts in Matthew 7, verse 21. And here's what Jesus says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do, do the will of my Father will enter heaven. And so he's trying to let them know that not everyone that gives lip service is actually having a heart transformation right. and really in relationship with me. And so and these are, this is a very chilling verse, and I yeah. don't think we see this preached in church very often, no. but this is some scary stuff. It is. This is this is scary stuff. Absolutely. It, 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 this is one of those better never born kind of scenarios. <laughs> I think it absolutely is. It really. I, I'm, I'm not even being cheeky with that. I, yeah. I mean it with all my heart. It would be better for you to have never been born to, than to have the King of Glory look at you and utter those words to you. Depart. I mean, de- right. It, you better Absolutely. that you never drew that first breath. So we've got this Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but only those who do the will of my Father. Mm-hmm. And he's saying that because he knows there's going to be people out there that think just because they have a casual relationship or because they have some sort of 
connection, like what I thought I had with these seniors, actually constituted a relationship that he would know me or they would know me. And so there is kind of the connection that we need to think about. There's something more going on here than what meets the eyes. Um, And it's all about this idea that there's more than just having knowledge about Jesus. Jesus, there's a level of obedience, a level of submission, a level of deeds that really kind of bring everything into full relationship. Um, And you've said this before, what is your spouse going to think how much you love them if all you do is say it and then you completely ignore them? Right, you can't say that at the altar. You're not really in relationship. That's right, you're right. If you you say those loving words at the altar and then ignore her for the next uh, however many years, years, it's not going to go 30 years. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it'll be pretty quick. But I think that's the point here is, is the will of the Father is what we need to be about in our actions once we have that faith that you are Lord. Because clearly the people here are saying, Lord, Lord. And right. so they're, 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 they're recognizing and acknowledging through lips, lip service, and maybe in, even in their heart to some degree they believe that. But. Notice that Jesus doesn't correct them here. Right. Many, bad, many bad and ugly things to happen in this scenario, in this anecdote, but yeah. one of them isn't that Jesus says, well, you didn't do any of those things. He doesn't call him a liar here. Right. So they did, in fact, do those miracles and wonders. They did, in right. fact, cast out demons, and yet right. they had absolutely no uh, relationship to him whatsoever. Right. Uh, this, absolutely. Hey, this, this, this brings us into a, a prophetic absolute that we must never forget, and that is God's gifts are irrevocable. That's for good and for bad. Right. What you get at birth as your gift, as your, as your anointing, you will have the whole of your life, whether mm-hmm. you use it okay. or not. And what a lot of people are doing is they are confusing God's anointing for God's approval. Right. They have the anointing of God, and God, for his own glory's sake, works in even very unrighteous people Absolutely. if they fall away from him. There are people right, right. now in the body of Christ who are high up in the, in the ecclesia, who are in positions of leadership, who are not okay. living the way they should. Right. But they still have the anointing of God manifesting in their life that they had back, that they may have had pruned and, and, and gleaned back when they were walking a better okay. walk. Mm-hmm. They've fallen away. This is a, it's a bone-chilling scenario that you can... Because yeah. uh, God doesn't take his gifts back, and it is possible to, to live your life and to be careless and let your heart grow hard and let your... Yeah, it is, absolutely. And God, for his own sake, will still keep manifesting in that ministry, only to find yourself at the end yeah. thinking you're all good, and the Lord has to look at you and say, uh-uh, no, right. not you. We're not, we're not in relationship. Samson's a great so. example of this. We have examples yeah. of this over and over in the yeah, Bible. sure. Where Samson basically was working in great power for 20 years he led Israel. Uh, we don't know many of the things. 20 years is a long time to lead a, a nation. Yeah, we yeah. only know a few of his anecdotes, so he must yeah. have had some faithful years there too. Yeah. By the end of it, he was going to prostitutes yeah. and, be, and being caught in there, but the Lord yeah. actually still manifested uh, uh, with him to deliver him from that until it finally got to a point where it was time to give him over to his own, yeah. his own free will, his own right. choices. Jesus says here in verse 22, many will say to me on that day, when Jesus said many... Many. He didn't mean, eh, it might or might not happen. He's going, I'm giving a warning. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Many. And in your name, drive out demons, and in your name, perform miracles. And so to your point here, we have individuals that Jesus is saying, there's going to be a lot of you guys out there that are doing wonderful stuff. You're casting out demons. You might have a gifting of teaching. You might have a gifting of administration. You might have a gifting of preaching. Right. And... Yet, I don't know you. I don't know. That's what he comes down to. And the fact of just because you said, Lord, Lord, and because you're walking out your anointing or your giftings are flourishing, does it really mean, and can that really mean that that's an indication of an internal transformation where you're in direct relationship ongoing with Jesus? Paul said, God cannot be mocked. Mm -hmm. He will not be mocked. You cannot live any way you want to and expect to have it go well for you. In That's the end. right. You know, God is just, he is holy. And his grace is there to pick us up when we fall. Yep. It, it most certainly is. We're not negating the miraculous power of God's grace to, to right. save and redeem those who are truly repentant. Right. Okay, that has nothing to do with this. What it does mean is that our repentance must be true. God cannot stand hypocrisy. Right. He hates it. And this is a warning against those who have allowed their hearts to grow hard and they think that because they're seeing right. God's, God... God's blessing manifest in their life and continue on that, you know, somehow that that's going to allow them to live any way they want to. And yeah. the fact that they cannot, 
you know, there, there are, there are so many anecdotes that, that bring this yeah, to absolutely. light in the, in the scripture, yeah. one after the other. We could fill up an hour just just going through the scriptures yep. that give this very warning. Yeah, and and I think that it's important for everyone here to realize that they seem to have faith in Jesus's name. They're doing miracles. They're doing signs. They're casting out demons. They're doing things in Jesus' name. These individuals are believers, and I know that there are certain camps out there that will say, "Well, they were never really saved," or they were, you know, they try no. to get into. And to me, I, I think that I'm not as worried about whether they're saved or whether they lost their salvation. But the fact of these individuals approached Jesus and said, "Lord, we've done lots of things." They began to debate with him about what their situation was. But Jesus makes it clear there's going to be a lot of these types of individuals who are, right. you know, kind of really going down this path, and we need to be careful of it. But you mentioned something about the condition of their heart. And as we look at that scripture, how many of you, after Jesus says, I don't know you, or that you won't come in, continue to argue with him and debate and say, but Lord, we did all these things in your name. That's right. And so that they're be- arguing and debating with him, thinking Jesus is the one who's mistaken. Right. Well, that should chill you even further. That yeah. conveys people who were standing or kneeling before the throne of God in this scenario, yep. completely, utterly, totally confident. They didn't go there thinking, uh, I'm not sure. Right. They were absolutely certain that oh, they were okay. Secure. They had, their their yeah. deception had been so thorough. Right. That they went there before the throne of God, thinking that they were going to be allowed to go in because they'd been taught forever that you can be any way you want to, act any way you want to, do whatever you wish, go your own way, and it'll be fine with you as long as you make some sort of lip service for the blood of Christ. (laughs) Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't work that right. way. It never did. Yeah, that's yep. uh, th- that's that's one of the great uh, doctrines of demons that has permeated the body of Christ, and it must be eradicated. No, it is a very bad one because here you have in Jesus essentially saying, "You say, Lord, Lord," and so what that's telling me is he's saying the proclamation that I am your Lord needs to be known in your heart, and your heart then needs to dictate your actions and not necessarily the external things that you see that you're doing that are going to indicate you have my favor. Right. It's better to be at his knees than exalted with signs and wonders or with giftings because those can be misleading, right? Right, right. God doesn't like to be patronized any more than we do. Yeah. It's, it's like when someone, a stranger comes up, or someone who is being unkind to you looks at you and calls you friend. It's like that... And, uh, it just ir- it just grates you. Yeah, and it's not real. It's not real. There's nothing genuine about it, and it actually equates to an insult. Right. You know, uh, that's pretty much what you're going to be you're, what you're going to be doing to the Lord here. If you're living your life the yeah. way, yeah, because Holy Spirit is with us, He permeates His existence. He knows what everything you've done. He knows every 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 deed, absolutely every thought. He's yeah, He's yeah. not questioning what you may have done. He knows before you even approach Him. Yeah, well, I love it. These individuals try to correct Jesus here. So that's a condition of their heart that actually is probably the beginning of their arrogance and obstinance. Um, Very interesting. Um, Luke actually gets at this a little bit too, and here's the verse in Luke 13, 26, and it says, "Then then we'll say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. Well, this is a different parable that talks about Jesus shutting the door, and the people on the outside are going, they're knocking on the door, and they're trying to fix Jesus's understanding of who they are. He's trying to let them know there's so much more to this than just the casual connection. Right, right. And your own perception of you being right with me. Right. So and Another thing to point out here I think is very salient is uh, Jesus called these unfortunate people evil doers. Yes, he did. You cannot gloss over that part of the text. That right. text right there, what it does is it eliminates all people groups. Right. He, in other words, it goes beyond Christians, it goes beyond pagans, it goes beyond everything else. Right. He is specifically saying evildoers. Right. You remember the body of Christ. Ask yourself, okay, what did I just do yesterday? Is the Holy Spirit checking you on something that you did? Was it evil? Was it something mm-hmm. that, that the Bible says is wrong to do? Is it evil? Well, congratulations. You're an evildoer. Repent. Right. You know, right. I've been there. I've had to repent. I've been right. an evildoer. Hey. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, that you don't no. want to go through your life and go th- before the throne of God as an unrepentant evildoer. That's right. The evildoer is what's being thrown out here. That's right. Individual who is so arrogant, they're going to try to fix Jesus first and not themselves. Right. And that's what's... The, the, the arrogance just, just astounds me. Well, but there are people out there that are, because their ministry is flourishing, or they have large churches or because their teachings are well-received, or whatever the gifting might be. And maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's something they just built up in their own mind that they're good. Right. But at the same time, it's not, not, our, it's, not our, it's not on us to decide we're okay with God outside of the plan of redemption and humility before the cross. Right. Yeah, we always get very excited when we have a book devotional that accompanies a particular podcast series. And in this instance, we have a devotional by the name of Walking in the Truth that accompanies our pod series, The Battle for the Truth. Never in modern times has the truth been under attack like what we are currently seeing. Vicious debates are raging over the sanctity of life, over sexuality, over gender identity, over the very existence of a loving God. Although Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 sternly warns against calling evil good and good evil, this seems to be the sad condition of our society these days. This devotional is dedicated to the only absolute truth that we have in this fallen world. The Holy Bible and the scriptures therein are given to us by a loving God to help us find our way home. The attack on the truth is simply the process of calling the goodness of God evil and the evil of Satan good and it's a blatant attempt to try to bring down the goodness of God to be equal to man or even below Satan. Walking in the Truth devotional covers key scriptures ranging anywhere from the testimony of truth in Jesus to how the Holy Spirit is involved in our walk as Christians to lead us into truth. And then it comes to a close with the judgment of the truth from God, which is kind of a rather heavy chapter, but really brings it home to make sure folks understand that God is paying very close attention to how we accept the truth and how we apply it to our lives. Readers will also have a personal reflection and prayer section for every verse covered. To learn how you can purchase Walking in the Truth, come visit our bookstore on thetruthandthelife.com and thank you for taking your time to support the Truth and the Life broadcast. And it must be pointed out right now that there is as much sin within the body of Christ as there is without it. This is not guesswork. There are people who actually do put together these matrices that have learned uh, through their through their R and D that the, the the percentages are pretty much the same right. of all the things that that constitute sin. Well, right. these things are being done by Christians. You know, the right. living together, right. the, the the premarital sex, the the yeah. things that the Bible clearly says do not do. Yeah, there's... and and they're doing them yeah. thinking thinking that it's okay because they're covered by this mysterious, magical, greasy grace that yeah. does not exist, was never sanctioned by God, right. and will get them put into the bad part of this scenario. Absolutely. And to their surprise, and that's the scary thing that it's terrifying. I just want folks to bring up, and not to try to scare you, fire and brimstone, but I think the worst thing we could always do is make the assumptions like these individuals that everything we do is okay with the Lord, And that being lukewarm, being casual, not being committed, means we're in a relationship and we just can go ahead and call on the blood of Christ and He's Lord without us ever even acknowledging or operating under His Lordship. Yeah, anybody who has ever been brought before any kind of justice, you know, think about a principal. When you you have that moment where, okay, you did the bad deed and you go to the principal's office, you have that, if you have any kind of a conscience at all, you have that moment you're sitting there and all of a sudden that cold... Dread washes over you, and justice is presented to you, yeah, and yeah. suddenly you would do anything to go back to the just before that transgression and yeah. undo it. I believe that's some of what you're seeing here with that Lord, Lord. You know, they're trying their best. They're it's dawning on them for the first time. They're standing in the the sterling light of the glory of God. Those eyes that see right through you are looking right, right. through them right now. Yeah, yeah. I believe some of the, what you're hearing there is bald panic. Yeah. Because they know the teachings better than anybody. They've taught right, it for right, years. Right. And they know what's coming. And mm-hmm. they're trying their best. You know, they may or may not be arrogantly thumbing their nose at God or trying to, air, to argue with them. Yeah. Some of them are, are, are doing that out of dread. 
right. you can actually see out of a last effort to right yeah. the, the sweat pouring down their face and trying their best to to talk him out of what they know is coming. Mm. Godly fear is a good thing. This is a real scenario. Yep. People have actually suffered this. There have this has actually been played out okay. to to their horror. There are people who have heard the clanking door of hell behind them, knowing that it's going to be eternal, and yeah. you don't want to be there. Right. Right. No, it, it is, uh, well, he said it, and it was a warning, and depart. It's the scariest word in all the <laughs> scriptures. Now, there, uh, in thinking about this, it's like, I know the Lord versus the Lord knows me, and Jesus making it clear, I don't know you, but that's kind of his way of just letting you know that um, he, there's no relationship. Right. He knows you, he knows everyone, he knows every hair kind of thing, so it wasn't that wasn't literal, I don't think. And there are different folks who will say, well, that means you were never saved. That's why he says he doesn't know you. And then others, you know, well, they lost their salvation. And I don't think the most important part of all this is trying to figure out, um, you know, kind of the technicalities. But the fact is, is he's saying many people are going to approach me and not be aware that they're not right with me. And when we have a spiritual blindness like that, that's very scary. We can all fall into that if we're not constantly judging and seeking our souls, following the scriptures. It's better to obey a scripture that might not apply necessarily to something you're getting ready to do than it is to completely sweep it away and say that grace is going to cover up your your error or your decision at that right, point. Right, right. The doctrine of demon that we've been talking about here, you know, the eternal security thing, it's got to be eradicated. It's got to be wiped out because right. it's harming people. It's, it sounds, has all the great, wonderful sounds to it that people uh, that draw folks to right. it but it's false right it's 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 failing to wave your hands at the uh, along the side of the road as the truck goes by knowing that there's a thousand foot plummet yeah. ahead of them you absolutely know, they're that's not kind at all the the bible is very clear that the that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the lord right that has never changed and yet when you go into our churches today and even the good ones right even 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 the good ones who have the holiness thing right uh the, the the fear of God is just so bereft in in in, our, in the ecclesia. Now. That's right. It, now you get you you get it in other parts of the world have a better fear of God because they're under they're they're under more dire circumstances. They understand right. Right. what they're having the sacrifice for. It. Right. But you know they're, 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 we, the fear of the Lord has to be reinserted into the body of Christ, and you know, and our King is that, a great King, and He yeah, will be honored. That fear and that reverence is a good thing. Yes. And you're right. Um, we can get so comfortable. Uh, that with his love and his grace and his mercy... Which are real. Th- th- which are absolutely real. In fact, we're not telling anyone that, um, or at least I'm not telling anyone, that I know exactly at what point you're right with him or not right oh, yeah. with him. That no is way. so personal, um, and I'm not the judge of that, and I'm not saying it. At the Where same time, you should you should have concern about that, um, a conviction about it, not a condemnation about it. Right. Now, we do have a couple of scripture scriptures here that we kind of pulled together that get right into the fact of, the Lord knows me, and first one is First Corinthians chapter eight verse three, where it says, "But whoever loves God is known by Him." So here we see a connection: whoever loves God is known by Him. So that is directly linked to John chapter fourteen verse fifteen, where it says, "If you love me, keep my commands." That's right. And so there's a connection here that is just not about lip service or about cognitive understanding. Right. If I understand the scriptures that I can go cast out a demon and I go do that, and God has done that through me, even if I don't have an anointing for it, but I do it one time and I do something else and then God keeps showing up to help me, he's not doing it because there's anything that necessarily takes away my sin other than the cross. He's doing it because he cares about the people I'm encountering. That's right. And he could be continually trying to draw me in closer to a relationship. But just because God shows up and does a miracle or blesses a teaching, or grows some sort of ministry right. that I'm running, it doesn't mean necessarily that um, I'm all right with God. No, we, have, we have biblical precedents for this. In the Old Testament, more than once God said through the prophets, you know, when he was discoursing about the wickedness okay. of the Israelites, mm-hmm. for my own name's sake, I did this. Right. Not because of you. Right. He pointed out that they were wicked and they were they were not worthy right. of any of that. But for my name. For my name's sake, I would not have it profaned yeah, among example. the nations, so I did this. I right. allowed Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Yeah, so and, and that is the same God we serve today. Absolutely. God does miracles not because of us, but despite of us. Right. And most of the time... 
It's about the person receiving the miracle and not the person participating in what God's doing with it. Oh, it should never be about the person doing it. We're just servants. Absolutely. And and that's where a lot of people get into error. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) When they when they start when they have that little click and may, they may not even realize yeah. it has happened when it's like oh clever me uh, when that moment happens you know God help you you Absolutely. you you need to seriously recalibrate right get before God and repent and say and 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 say hey look I'm just a servant here everything that Absolutely. happens in my life that manifests in my life is for somebody else so that. We can build up this temple of God. And I think that's what's so important, and that's what I kind of read into the scriptures here, is that they believe they were so blessed and he was with them, and they had his favor, and they had his approval, because all these things were happening. They got a little bit arrogant, to the point to where, instead of him saying, I don't know you, and going, dropping on their knees, they could have been in panic mode. But to me, I, I, I think it's better to be in humility, not to seek anything, and to just submit to his authority because then you know you're at the foot of the cross, you know you're at his feet, you know, but not to the point of condemnation, because I know a lot of churches, they take this route of his love will lift you up, his mercy has you, and all that's wonderful. The problem is, is that can lull us to sleep in a way that we forget about not being proud, because being a Christian isn't about being special, it's about being a child of God that's a humility, right. that has a job to do while we're here. And yes, we are special. We're Everyone's special. But, this but is... that doesn't that should not make us feel like um, we don't have to do our part right. in pursuing the relationship. And just like what John said in, in, in Corinthians, if you love me, I know you, and if you love me, you obey my commands. There you go, and and it goes right full circle to what you said at the very beginning of this thing. It's about relationship. About relationship. This is not rocket science. <laughs> no. We're not talking about things that are too hard to do. That's right. God wants you in heaven with Him forever. Yeah. And and, and anyone who has been in any any kind of earthly relationship knows that if if it's bad, you know it. Right. If you're phoning it in, you know it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And God will let you know. And if you harden your heart and you've ended up in this situation, you only have yourself to blame because God Almighty has bent over backwards, literally, to make sure that you were woken up before that time came. Absolutely. We have absolutely no excuses. And you know, you can pity these people for 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 succumbing to this all the live long day. And I do. I pity anyone who ends up ends up like that. But there'll be many. There'll be many, and it's their own fault. If you're in relationship with someone, you know it. Right. And here, a relationship doesn't mean you're just giving a gift. It means you're giving your heart. And I think that's where Jesus is at. Absolutely. He wants you. And if you, and if he belongs to you and you belong to him, there's no mystery there. Right. And there, and there, and that is what takes out the fear. Right. You know, there is no fear in love, as John said. Absolutely. And the reason why there's no fear is because there's love. Right. When there's no love, when you're doing the things that these people were doing to God in that scenario where they were doing. They were benefiting from his signs and wonders and right. benefiting from all the things that made them look good. Right. And then taking for him for granted behind the scenes yep. and treating him with contempt, that's not love. Right. Absolutely is not love. And that's where I, we talked about the greasy grace. Now, there's another thing out there, and it's more of a pharisaical trade-off here, and that is the fact of your good deeds can never cover up the sinful things. And so the scripture specifically said, you evildoers. Well, the word for that is anomia, and that uh, translates uh, from the Greek into a violator of the law, someone who does iniquity, uh, wickedness. And I think what we need to understand here is as he begins to say, you did all these things, and it could be that they're good. That was good. But you had other things in your life, you evildoer, that you felt like, I did good things, and then that actually got, you know, I did five good things, that takes away from the five bad things I did, and that becomes the pharisaical trade-off back and forth of, you do enough good deeds, it covers up all the sinful deeds, which is not the case. But clearly, anomia in Greek refers to without law. He's right. talking about his commands. You were lawless, as some tra- uh, some transcripts will say. Right. It means you didn't obey me. If you let that go, it'll go to ridiculous lengths, too. Mm-hmm. It's like the mob boss who basically murders and, and goes around with prostitutes and everything else all, all week long, right. donates a wing to the hospital, he gets exemption from the priest, and they'll, that's supposed to make him good. Right. I guarantee it didn't. Yeah, you, no, there, no. There is there is no trade off there that you can't. Right. There's no. It's not a zero sum game. There's there. only one thing that removes sin. That's and right. That's the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ and true, repentance. True pre- repentance. That's right. Absolutely. And 
I think that gets to that very deeply. And there could be a lot of debates on what's going on here. To me, it makes me very nervous because these individuals were spiritually blind to their relationship with That's right. Jesus. To their own condition. And I their own condition. And we need to take that seriously in a level of conviction that brings us to our knees, but not in a level of condemnation that crushes our soul. No, no, right. Because he can lift us up. But before we can be lifted up, we have to have convic- conviction and repentance, just like at the point of salvation. That's right. It's just, in the end, it's all about hypocrisy. You, yeah. God hates hypocrisy. Yeah. And you, you cannot, God cannot be mocked. If you try it, it will not work out for you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to do a quick recap like we always do. Okay. And that is lip service to the Lord hmm, is most likely going to result in your departure from his presence. All right. And that is scary. Uh, Scariest words in the Bible. Better never, better never born. Better never born. Number two, external signs and wonders, whether it's miracles, whether it's casting out demons, whether it's your teaching gifts, whether it's your preaching gift, whether it's your prophesying, whatever it might be is not a true indication of an internal transformation right. and relationship with Jesus. Thank yes, you. it's not you doing it. He's doing it through you, but most likely because he's trying to connect to somebody that's not you, that's receiving it. That's right. He's doing your job for you. He's you doing your job you, for you. Yeah, you should Absolutely. be involved in that, and you're, and you're yeah. being negligent. Absolutely. All right, number three, being known by God is connected with loving God, and loving God is connected with obedience, obedience. to God's commands. So there's scriptures there, and a part of, a part of that obedience is obedience from the heart where the heart is joyful about being obedient, That's right. about doing the Word of God. Being obedient and being miserable about it isn't the same thing. That's right. This, right? Is, not, this is not about rules and regulations and taking things off. Absolutely. If you've ever been in the presence of God Almighty, you know how wonderful He is. Yeah, These absolutely. things should be a joy to do for Him. Absolutely. And it's about, in the end, it's about relationship. Being in the family. That's right. Being in the family. All right, we want to thank you for tuning in. Now, come visit us at thetruthandthelife.com. And until our next episode, we'll see you on the way. To learn more about the way, visit the truth and the life dot com. Send me your songs of tomorrow.